Restaurant Unstoppable. Inspire, empower, and transform the industry. And with excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, entrepreneur, podcast host, and hospitality consultant, and director of Mirables and Green Hills Grill, Brandon Still. My man, Brandon, are you feeling unstoppable today? I am I'm feeling unstoppable, yeah. Yeah, man. I cannot wait to get into this story. And we actually met by way of your podcast. I said you're a podcast host, but that's a Nashville restaurant radio. Uh, we do very similar types of podcasts, which is make me is which is making me very excited because I don't get to talk to other people that do very similar things to what I do. Like lots of other podcasters out there, but not so specific to like subject matter and you're like even more specific than I am because you're really hyper focused on Nashville. You go outside of Nashville, but I do briefly from yeah. time to time yeah. when I, when I meet somebody who's really interesting from another state and I just kind of want to hear their perspective, I, I, I call them and Hey, let's do an interview. I'd love to share your perspective from your market with my listeners in Nashville and, um, I have a lot of fun with it, but yeah. thanks for having me. I think that, uh, you were one of the people who I originally started listening to when I first started podcasting and you actually reached out to me just randomly. I don't know what platform it was on. You said, Hey man, I checked out your podcast. It's really good. And I was like on the floor, <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, you know, it's funny. The guy that knows you, who I am. It's funny that you mentioned that. Like I try to make it a point to one of the biggest lessons that I've learned as a podcast host is that it's always studying restaurant tours. It's always the restaurant tours that are welcoming of new business or, or welcoming of people who others would say my competition, but the best restaurant tours are collaborators. They know 100%. that they can't do it alone and they, they build community around themselves. And that's a person to, to reach out to in the future and say, Hey, what'd you do for this? Or how, what was, I have this challenge. Do you have this challenge? And you go so much further together. So I made it a point early on to reach out to new podcasters to open the door to say, Hey, I'm not your competition. Like we can go much further together. Well, you know, on, on your thing here, it says melting pot of mentors. And as far as people in the podcasting world for myself, Hey, I don't know how to do advertising. I, I would reach out to you and you were so willing to kind of give me some advice here and there. So, I mean, a big, big thank you for all that you've done to help me. And I just did my 200th episode. Congratulations. Uh, came out today. The, the pleasure is my congratulations. Thank man. you. What a, what a something worth celebrating right there. You're actually celebrating something else in like three days, which is really Setting. Maybe a little teaser to what will be discussed later, but sure, yeah, yeah. Three days, uh, October twenty eighth is two uh, two years sober, uh, no no alcohol, no mind altering substances, nothing for two whole years. Congratulations! I cannot say that myself, but <laughs> <laughs> congratulations, man. Good for you, and um, we'll get into that. We haven't even gotten into the success quote or mantra, but I, I'm feeling jacked up already. So we got to get that motivational inspirational ball inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra what do you got for us all right i i i quote this way too often to people who tell me that they can't do something and henry ford said if you think you can do a thing or think you can't do a thing you're right mm. and i'm just all about mindset man i wake up every day monday's my favorite day and i come in the morning to work monday morning and i'm jacked up and i'm like it's Monday, guys. Here we go. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. And everybody's like, dude, what are, what are you on? And I'm like, it's the first day of the week. We can accomplish so much this week. It's like <laughs> yeah. I get around a Friday and I'm like, oh, shit, I have to finish everything. I haven't finished yet. But Monday, man, I have so much to look forward to. So I think it's everything is about the power of your mind. And whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And that's just something that I tell people when they say, oh, I can't possibly do that. And I go, really? I guess if that's your thought, then you can't. So, well, I mean, there's science behind this and like there's, and I, I think I, I reference this a lot in the podcast. You probably already know where I'm going with this if you're a regular listener, but your frontal lobe shuts off when you say I can't, or it's not possible that create a part of your mind just because it's a, it's a huge energy suck. That part of your mind is like, it, it's a huge energy suck. It is. So the, the natural, uh, reaction for your brain is to like save energy and like you can choose that it's not possible, then your mind just goes, phew, don't have to worry about that. But if you say, this is possible, how is it possible? And you start asking yourself how, that frontal lobe kicks into the hyperdrive, and like it just starts figuring things out. It just starts looking at possible, like the creativity kicks in. Creative Creativity is expensive, though. It is. <laughs> yeah, you can ask the owner of our restaurant about that. <laughs> He's fully aware. 
I, you know, we have a book that we, we have, it's, it's kind of required reading around here. It's called QBQ, the question behind the question. It's by a guy named John G. Miller. I've had him on my podcast twice. I actually saw a, a quick reference, like a, a video clip of that. He's amazing. And um, what he does is that same sort of thing is that it's about taking away victim uh, victim thoughts. You say, how come my food always comes out cold? How come nobody ever busts my tables? How come I never get sat the good tables? Your brain immediately starts feeling like a victim. There's things, you, how come they, I never get the good parking space? Whatever it might be in your life, whatever victim they, if you're asking yourself questions where they is in that question, immediately your brain starts thinking that something happened to you as a reason why you can't. And the question behind the question changes your brain to think, what can I do? What do I have control over? Yeah. So, hey, how come my, how come you, nobody ever runs my food? What can I do to ensure my food gets ran? You insert yourself into the question. What can I do to ensure that my food comes out hot? What can I do to ensure that I get the best tables? What can I do? And our mission here at these restaurants is, what can I do to make every guest a repeat what, guest? What can I do to make my vision into reality? Yeah. Make my dream into reality? Just putting it out there, right? Like Listening to you talk is reminding me of a recent guest we had, Mel Harrington, who literally just put it out there to one of her customers. Like, this is what I want to do. I know you're somebody who can help me. There's a good chance you won't, but if there is a slight chance you can, then you'll never know unless I say something right now. What can I do right now? What do, what can I do? Right? What can I do right yeah. now? Put yourself into the solution and just, and go for it. Yeah. And because of that, she, she, he bought her a house and barn. Wow. Right. Because he, she was able to find a win-win situation in that frontal lobe kicked into hyper gear and they made it happen. But you have, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're driving home the point. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's all about mindset, you know? And I think you, every day, uh, I used to have a boss says, what sucks you out of the sheets? You know, and that's one of those things that like, what is exciting for you? Like, what makes you want to get up and get going for the day? And I think you got to find a, a job that you love. And I think for people like us, I can talk about restaurant shit for, for hours. That's oh, just yeah. concepts, what we're doing, how you're doing it. I love hearing creativity, just your right. perspective. But I could talk restaurant stuff for. I think we're gonna kick the can back and forth pretty good today. Yeah, um, I'm I'm excited for this conversation. You did say you had two quotes, and I don't want to sell you short. It's it's a, it's along the same lines. Uh, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. Yet another Henry Ford quote. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I tell people here is that when they hire, I, I had the best interview ever with a kid who never waited tables before, and he looked at me and he said. I said, you never wait tables. Is that going to be like, what, what are your biggest challenges? He goes, look, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, but I never make the same mistake twice. I wish I could say that. I'm going to learn. <laughs> I'm going to learn from my mistakes every single day. And I just thought like, wow, I would hire that person any day of the week because I encourage people to make mistakes. That's how, let, let's me know you're alive. Let's me know you're trying. You're stepping outside of your comfort zone because you're trying something you make a mistake. And when you turn around and say, that one's on me, I did that, and I'm going to grow from that, then that's that's everything. Yeah, man. Great way to get this thing started. Where does it make sense to start sharing your story as far as how you got <coughs> to where you are today? Uh, I mean, over 25 years of experience in the industry, if I think my research serves me well. Correct. Uh, at what point were you like, this is my career, this is what I want to do? Wow. Um, I was at a restaurant here in Nashville called Amerigo. And I had worked in the industry for maybe seven, eight years, uh, maybe no, six years into it, back and forth, different restaurants, you know, as a misfit, you know, doubles, go drinking in between shifts, just, just making money, being dumb. And I got to this restaurant and we had a group of people working with us that were, were pretty talented. We had a different level of team and we all kind of challenged each other and our leadership team were the first kind of managers that I really looked up to. And I had a manager who kind of took me under his wing and said, you know, hey, this is what you need to do. If you want to do something with your life, if you want to be in this business. And at that point, I was like, yeah, I, th I love this. This is everything I want to do. And I made a decision and I got into management at age 22 and I left college. And I knew at that moment that I, I can have, I can sit in a class and have a professor teach me uh, what their experiences were like, or I have the opportunity to move out of state to run the this restaurant's busiest concept uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, of all places, and uh, it was amazing. It was it was life changing for me, 
and I just loved it. It was everything about it. Since that day, I haven't. So the year is two thousand. We're going back twenty one years ago at this yeah. point. Uh, you, you had this manager who said, "This is what you need to do." What was that? That can you recall what he said you needed to do? I don't know if it's more of a what you need to do is more of a what not to do and recognizing the burden of leadership because I was kind of a, a, a jackass at the time, you know, we're just partying every night, did really well, waiting tables, made a lot of money, but he kind of turned so around. You, wait, were you in Nashville? At this I was point? in Nashville. Yeah. yeah, I was here at the time. That's a and dangerous it, place to make a lot of money. It was. Well, I mean, we're talking years old, 20 years, years ago. Yeah. Nashville wasn't what it is today. But I still mean, a lot of fun was being had in Nashville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, fun you guys was, have always had a reputation for being a ragtag bunch of people. We had a good time. It was, <laughs> it was more of a, hey, when you're the boss, you can't come in and hug everybody. When you're the boss, you can't go drinking at night with everybody. When you're the boss, everything that you say to somebody, they remember because you're their leader. You have to lead by example every single day. And it was something that really never really landed on me. I had bosses my whole life and never recognized what leadership really was. Mm. I still moved to Mississippi, no idea, not really listening, but really getting into that, I found it so fascinating. And I just, I something, I don't know what it was about it, but I, I fit in really well yeah. and I loved it. And I just want, I, get, I did my level one sommelier in 2003. And I just, I just jumped all in head first so into the you, industry. I know you said you don't know what it is, but you loved it. But I really like to get at what it is that sucks people in what it is that you love because I, I, I know for for some reason I just think that's important I think the so I love sales I've always been into sales I've always been into I'm very competitive I was always an, an athlete I'm six foot six I didn't have a choice I, I, was, I was I was a basketball player had to do everything and I don't know I think that my my love language is acts of service you know, when you go back to the, the five lo love languages, something about me feels fulfilled when I help somebody, when I'm able to take somebody who's not doing well and somehow make them better to, to serve somebody brings me joy. It makes me feel whole and something about the competitive nature of waiting tables with other people who are competitive and selling specials and selling wine and at the same point taking somebody who i've always said the second somebody walks in a restaurant you have no idea what if they just put their dog down if they just won the lottery if they just got divorced if they just got married you have no idea what mindset they're in but i do know that i can give a level of service when they come in the building that they're going to leave happier when the, than when they showed up mm. and that was my ultimate goal it was never money i was never motivated by money i was always motivated by are you going to leave here and be in a better place? And was I a part of that? Yeah. And I, that resonates with me. I mean, for me, I don't know if it's quite the same for me. I just like, I like approval. You know, I want to know that you approve of me and what I'm doing for you. And I feel like food is one of the easiest ways to get that sense of approval or bringing people together or just show, uh, throwing a party, making people happy. I mean, I think mine, I don't, it's almost em embarrassing because I don't know if people like to admit that we all want to be approved. Like we care what if people approve of us. Um, it's human nature. Uh, but I listening to you talk, I can't help but think of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs or right above like the most basic needs is being seen, being valued, being loved. We all need that, you yeah. know? And I think that is a big part. And I, I want to do research into this because I think that's where we evolved to be hospitable and warm and caring and generous because we want to be accepted. Well, it's interesting because the first interview that I did for my podcast was on March 17th, 2020. The first, second interview, but it was the first day. And I interviewed a woman named Margot McCormick, who's a legend here Past in Nashville. Past on the show. Pat, yeah. yeah. If, she's unbelievable. And I was talking to her that day, and she was down. And she was very sad. Obviously, this is the day that they're closing all of the restaurants. And I said, tell me like what, what kind of emotions you're having. And she said... You know, this is the way that we as culinary, as servers, as chefs, this is how we give love. She goes, how we give love is that I, she goes, I make this food that's nourishing, not only just because of the actual nourishing, but like you're in this environment where it's, it's friendly and it's warm. And I, I make this food and I show my love that way. And you give it back by enjoying it and leaving here happy or telling me, writing reviews and letting me know. She goes, that's how I receive love. And I don't know what I'm going to do when I have to tell my entire staff, you have to go home and you can't do this anymore. You know, just, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to feel accepted if I can't do that. And it 
resonated real strong with me. I mean, we're kind of getting ahead of some of the things I wanted to be talking about, but that's okay. I'm just going to un- unpackage it here. I don't know if you, I, I know I asked you before we hit record, if you had caught the new David Chang docu series, that's like the, the future of food, basically like how we're going to eat food. I can't remember the name of it. It just it came out like last week, right? It's still fresh. Um, but he gets into this and like, we need to ask ourselves is like, is this what we want is convenience? Like what's the price we pay? for convenience and option, right? And I think the price we pay for convenience and option is less of what you're talking about, less about being seen, being valued, because we don't get this, we don't get, the cookie is the fucking smile on your face when I do the thing in the the visual gratitude that you're having. Yeah. And when you extract that, when you extract that from the equation, what's the point? I, I tend to agree with you completely. I mean, we gotta ask ourselves, what is the price of convenience? I think it's, I think there's a, there's a hefty price to pay yeah. for convenience. And I think that right now post pan, I don't know what the fuck we're in. Is this post pandemic? I don't know what this is. I mean, I think is this, this is purgatory. Is this purgatory? I, I hate pandemic? the expression new normal, but I think it's just going to be a combination, but I think we're learning too much about human behavior. I think to let this just happen. And this is back to why I always say we got to be less reactive and more proactive as an industry, telling the consumer what they need, not reacting to what we think they want, you know, like, listen like everything you're asking for comes for like we need to start influencing people and saying cut the shit like you're ruining things you're not making them better if we give you what you want well I, you know i think we i think the one thing i've learned one of the things i've learned a lot during this pandemic is how we treat people in the industry in this restaurant industry how the actual employees get treated at restaurants and i think that a lot of people have made big time changes. They've paid a lot more. Um, certainly understanding individuals' rights and, and making safer workplaces. I think that gone are the days of the chef who's misogynist and just screaming and yelling all day, cuss words, throwing knives. Those Nobody wants to work at that place anymore. And I think that we as restaurateurs have to do a really good job of taking care of the people because I think the people are fed up and they don't want to be put in that environment anymore. And they're going to find other professions and we're going to be forced to go to these QR code menus and technology is going to come in. It's almost like every time I go to a grocery store and I, and there's a, a line of people for the self checkout, I go, man, I, I try and get in line where there's a person, you know, yeah. because it's, it's just a little interaction of, Hey, how you doing? Did you find everything? Okay. I'm like, you know what? I did. How yeah. are you today? Just to see the look on their face to go, thank you for asking. I'm doing, I'm okay. Or whatever it is, just to have a little bit of that interaction with people. I think we're just moving with technology. We're just moving farther and farther away from it every day. Yeah. We've never been more connected and more disconnected at the same time. It's kind of ironic. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, I could go on and on and talk like into like these, like go into these little rabbit holes with you. And I'm sure we're, I'm, I've intentionally blocked time at the end <laughs> of our conversation to do just that. Uh, but I yeah. want to get back to your story. So, uh, age 22, 21, early 2000s, you have this manager who says, you know, I see something in you, you got this, but this is what you got to do. And you got to stop being a knucklehead. You got to start going out with the, you know, you got to start partying with the people that we're employing. You need to draw lines. There's actually a really great book from Ken McGarry, um, the surprise restaurant manager that I think every restaurant owner should give their employee that covers this exact subject. Really? Yeah. It's really, I've never heard of it. I would love to introduce you to Ken. He's great. Um, but just wanted to let the listeners know, um, read that book if you want to learn more about what you were discussing. Uh, so you, did they pull you out of this market and send you someplace else? What tell us more about this restaurant that you were working for America. Was it like a restaurant group? It was, well, they are now, uh, that restaurant's changed hands twice since okay. the day. And that gentleman, his name is Doug Hogreef. Okay. Um, is a guy that I've always looked up to and, um, is a mentor of mine. And he, uh, he actually is the owner. Now he and a group of the original general managers bought it. They're called four top hospitality. And uh, they own multiple concepts now. They have a restaurant downtown called Etch. They have one in Green Hills called Etc. They have Etch. a restaurant called who's Char. The, who's the restaurant? Deb Paquette. I've had Deb on the show. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Right? So Deb and Ernie me. are awesome. But Doug's been that guy for me for a really long time. Moved me to Jackson, Mississippi. I was there two and a half years. Came back to Nashville. Took over the Brentwood location. And then I got married. And my wife said, you got to get out of the business. What year is it now? 2005. Five years after. Five um, years after. Get out of the business. Do you think she was right? 
Yeah. Why? I think I was not on a healthy path. Mm. You know, I think that we, I did this thing called Brandon's Book Club and Anthony Bourdain, uh, we just did Kitchen Confidential. And so many people look up to him and they go, man, that, that guy's like a rock star and he's everything to me. And if you read his next book, he goes, people come up to him all the time at trade shows or he's signing books and like, then they'll hand him drugs. And he's like, hey, look, I, I don't want that. He was like, that book wasn't a book that was like this superhero tale. That was a book of what not to do. He goes, I made it out of there. I made it out. I quit doing heroin. I'm an addict. Yeah. He goes, I was able to make it out of the kitchen and live. I'm not some kind of hero. This book was a book as to like, I did this. You don't have to take it seriously. Travel. Go do other things. Yeah. And that's kind of what I, the way I feel. Like, I was on that path. Mm-hmm. You know, you're crazy working 70 hours a week, partying all night long, drinking way too much. Just, you know, I have that. I'm an addict too. Mm-hmm. And I think my wife saw that and she was like, hey, I don't, I don't want you to go down that path. And I got into... Got into the produce world. I got into I got into food sales. You know, it's interesting because we that's something you hear about a lot. Like, what's your real job or what are you trying to work towards? And I think that's a lot of the reason why this industry has such a bad reputation because because people end up going down the wrong path because we get sucked in. I mean, we're so if you have if you're somebody with an addictive personality, you're surrounded by your vices. Yeah. You know, you you and you're surrounded by generally typically other people. Are, I mean, I would say there's a type of person that's attracted to the restaurant industry, outgoing, enthusiastic, extrovert. Like, there's a lot of those type of people. I think there's a lot of characteristics of the types of habits of people that are. So you're also attracted by triggers, other people that want to do the same thing as you. Um, and cash. And cash. I mean, yeah. You work all day, and then the other Burning night a you get a bunch of cash, and it's like, well, I can go out drinking. Yeah, I like, have cash. Yeah, like, uh, and people who have, like, who have addictive personalities or tend to be impulsive. Yeah, you know, so you have this breed of person. You're putting them all together in the same place with cash in their pocket, young, looking to have a good time. It's a kind of a recipe for disaster, you know. And my wife said, uh, "No mas," which you know, in that time. I didn't quite understand. I was like, hey, look, this is what I did when I met you. This is what I've done throughout our entire relationship. And now you're telling me I can't do that? And it, it, you know what? It was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. Aren't women great sometimes? I, You know, she, the <laughs> foresight she had. And she's amazing. We've been married now for 16 years. She celebrated our 16-year wedding anniversary. So she was on to something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't get into like the, the difference of sexes, but I think women absolutely have this way of... <laughs> <laughs> kicking men in the ass and turning them around real fast. So thank you to your wife. Um, I am curious. Uh, oh man, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm not going to lie. Uh, what were you going to say before I, I, I was just going to say, I went to a, I went to a company called uh, creation gardens. They were based out of Louisville, Kentucky. And I was a, I sold produce and they were a tiny, tiny company. They're running a truck out every day. They had three box trucks. I think that went around and they were tiny. It's a small little company and they, the vice president came into the restaurant and he was um, cold calling the restaurant. And I said, why is the vice president calling on a restaurant? Shouldn't you have like a sales? He goes, we're brand new in town. We don't have anybody yet. But, you know, and I had a buddy who just got back from uh, Iraq and I was trying to find him a job because he was working with me. He was wearing me out and I didn't want to have to like fire him. I was like, I'm trying to find this guy a job. And he told me, he goes, it pays, you know, X amount of dollars and you get a company car. And I was like, hey, now. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. And they were such a unique company. They were so right up my alley. They said, basically, we want to be different than every single other company. And we want to be the people that provide the level of service you're providing to your guests. We want to do that for chefs. And I thought, no shit. Like that's, I could do that. Like we, everybody always gives these chefs rules. You must order by four. You must do this. You must do that. You can't split this. You can't split that. He goes, we split every single thing that we sell. We can order until midnight for next day delivery. We order deliver seven days a week. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I jumped into that full on. Like, again, I don't do anything half ass. And we built that thing three and a half years into the economic downturn, like 3,000% in business. I mean, we brought on, we were pretty large by the time I left. And I was in every single kitchen in the city, independently owned local uh, restaurants until uh 2009 happened and i had i think i had like 49 accounts by myself i was driving a truck on mondays i was doing 
Uh, my warehouse is in Louisville, so I was still. I spent like thirty thousand dollars at Jeez. Costco that final year, and I called the owner. And I said, "Look, I can't do this. I need help." And he said, "Just work harder. I cannot hire anybody. It's a, it's a, there's a uh, economic downturn." He said, "Just hire somebody." And that day, Fresh Point, who's a you know another is a national company owned by Cisco, called and said, "Hey, we want to have lunch with you." And I didn't really have any intention of leaving, but they came by and said, "Look, we don't know what you're doing." We assume you have like a part, a, a team of like ten sales reps. What's going on? I go, it's just me. I want to get into what it is exactly that you're doing. So just to go back, you, you joined this this company called Creative Solutions. They take what exactly did what was the solution that they were offering restaurants? Spell that out one more time for us. Well, it's Creation Garden. Sorry, they're actually they're actually called. They've changed their company name to What Chefs Want. Creation Gardens. This is what happens when I take notes while I'm trying to listen at the same time. Uh, Creation Gardens. Uh, and say it one more time. What it is exactly that they were doing? So they had a pretty, pretty simple mission. The owner he owned an ice company and he sold all the ice, these big, huge chunks of ice to people that did ice carvings. And he had all this cold storage. So he started very small and started carrying some different produce items. These chefs would come in and they would buy ice from him. He started carrying some special items. And the chefs would come in and he'd said, "What? What would you like to see more of?" I want to see more produce. I want to see more specialty. What's going to make your life easier if I could do things differently? I'm an independently owned guy. Well, we want deliveries on Sundays. We don't want to have to have minimums. We want to order late at night. If you have to place our order at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't know what I'm going to use that night, so it makes it a challenge. So he just basically put a, put a product together. He said, look, you can order them until midnight for next day. We're going to deliver seven days a week. You have no minimums, and you can split anything that you want in any case. So you're kind of like a gopher for like these chefs that – are trying to be creative last second and they need things. You're going and getting it. I was more was on demand. Very much smoke and mirrors because I would tell them, yeah, we have fava beans. Yeah, we have chanterelles. We've got, you know, hen of the yes, woods. We've, we've like, got oh, those I things. Said, yes, where do I get it? And the next, well, 90% of the time we'd have it. But the times that they didn't, then I would go to Whole Foods. Or if they'd say, this isn't pencil asparagus, I need Sharpie size asparagus. Well, then I'm going to Costco. I didn't yeah. have a local warehouse. So, I did all, I literally was in my car, I had Nextel walkie talkies and we're back in the, you know, the yeah. little noise. I'd have a driver. Hey Brandon, this is Brian. I'm in with chef Ricky and he doesn't like his asparagus. Can we give him some more out today? And I would go, Dilip. yeah, tell Ricky I'll have it for him in an hour. Yeah. And then I would have to go find it. So like you're just a, a networker, like you had a network, you knew over time you build that network, you know, who has what, you know, where to get what. Um, oh, I, I could I could find you any produce item in the city. You remind me a lot of what Cameron Carrington's philosophy. Cameron is out of uh, Cameron Mitchell, sorry, Cameron Mitchell restaurants out of Columbus, Ohio, uh, and he his famous thing is the answer is yes. What's the question? And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Where you're like the answer is yes. What do you need? Okay, I'll find it. What happens when you don't have it? <laughs> I don't know. I never had that happen. Well, that's crazy. No, I mean. I woke up every morning and it was just me in this tiny, I had three trucks I'd meet off of the interstate and the, the semi would come down from, from Louisville and we'd meet three little box trucks with back up to it. We would have pull a pallet transfer jack in between and we would just run back and forth. But I woke up every morning and I realized that I had Murphy produce and Ernest Williams produce and Dixie produce and there were seven other produce companies, not to mention the Broadliners and Cisco, GFS, PFG, Reinhardt, US Foods. All these other companies were against me, and it was just me. I had me and my drivers. And so I realized every morning I had to wake up with 100 people trying to take everything I had worked for. And I had to defend it with all of them. And I had to work harder. I had to work smarter. I had to do everything in my within every ounce I had. So just seven days a week, I'm at a dock at 5 a.m. loading and unloading trucks. Driving a truck one day a week because I wanted the drivers to know I'm not scared. Where is there a dock in Nashville? Uh, well, there's, there's a, there's. I had to go find one. That was another thing. I had to go find. I had to rent a dock space. Oh man. Where I could, at some point, I had to load. I think of a dock. I think of like something next to the ocean. That's because that's my. Oh no no no! Like a yeah. like a like a. You pull up your trailer. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, you'd unload everything onto a dock and then reload it. Not like, like you're a, driving to the ocean to get these things. <laughs> um, no, it just it was it was a lot. It was just a straight hustle an entrepreneurial kind of a if i don't do this i'm gonna fail and this is what it took to get the job done so you got to do it so when i met with fresh point they go we just assumed you had like 10 reps and i'm like no it's just me and they're like so you what? have all these people competing against you for your business what's the one thing that you had 
that these bigger organizations cannot compete with that lets you compete? Hustle. Yeah. I mean, hard work. There's one thing that I'm curious about, and, I, and I, I'm not saying your answer is wrong because I'm sure that was ab- absolutely it, but what was your relationship with these individuals like versus the bigger broadliners? Oh, no. Yeah, it was much more genuine. My entire purpose, I wasn't there to drive profitability. I was there to help them succeed. Yeah. I mean, I genuinely cared that they got the product they needed and that their guests, my, yeah. my, my guest, like my end customer was their guest. Mm-hmm. And they knew that my, I knew in my heart that if I didn't get them that product when they needed it, that their guest would suffer yeah. and I was not going to have that. Yeah. So you were with this actually, before we get into that question, um, one lesson that you pulled, you were with this company for 3.7 years. Mm-hmm. One lesson that you think has stuck with you the longest a skill, maybe a transferable skill to the restaurant industry, something that you saw other restaurant owners doing that you were like, wow, like that's something that I'm going to take with me for the rest of my life. What was like some, something that blew you away that isn't standard within the industry, but you adopted because of this experience? You know, on the spot, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you one thing, but I will tell you that inspirational, motivational (laughs) quote that I gave you earlier whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. We had the owner of this company. His name is Ron Turnier. He uh, he would constantly tell me that I need to do things. And I would go, that's impossible. And he would kind of come back with, it's not impossible. You just need to make it happen. You need to work smarter. You need to do this. You need to do that. And every single time I powered through, I made it happen. So it was that when I thought that I couldn't do something. It was impossible. It was impossible. But yeah. when he would come back and he would lead me. To, to think I can do it, I could do it. And the things that I did back then were, I mean, it's ridiculous. There's no, I couldn't do them now. I, mean, I just don't think I had the, the time or the energy to do it now. But it was amazing that what I accomplished in those almost four years. I love it. And you, I mean, three, almost three and a half, over three and a half years, uh, you were with this company. You're killing it. Uh, nobody could do what you do. Uh, why leave? And I think you started getting into that. You had somebody approach you. I had somebody approach me, and I, I was – I was pretty, I was pretty burnt out. I mean, to tell you the truth, I mean, I had, 2009 was a really tough year. Uh, a lot of restaurants weren't doing well. Everybody was just getting as lean as you possibly can. No hiring. And I was growing and, uh, we were, we were expanding our line. We're now bringing restaurant staples in as well as produce. We're, and I was like, I just couldn't do it. And I was really, I told my wife, it's funny on a Friday, I told my wife, I said, I just wish fresh point was my biggest competitor would just call me and I, I, I might call them like, cause they had all these beautiful trucks and their drivers had uniforms and they had a, <laughs> they had a local warehouse. And I was so envious of all of these things. Cause I was wearing every single hat. Yeah. I'm loading trucks. I'm unloading trucks. I'm doing the sales. I'm doing the service. I'm doing collections. I'm all of this. And like, they have all these neat things. And, and it was literally that Monday, it was April the 20th. That I got a phone call. Um, and they said, we just want to have lunch. And after the lunch, we kind of, they said, we would love for you to come in and do all the things you're doing for them. Like that we want, we we don't have that spirit. Our sales reps sit in offices all day long in key numbers. They don't go out and get it. We, we want your spirit in this building. And, um, it's very humbling to felt, to feel seen because I've got bosses telling me just work harder. We're not sending you any help. Just work harder. I'm like, I'm working seven, 12 hour days, man. I can't work any harder. And they said, we have a full distribution team. We have a collections team. All you have to do is sell. That's it. Just, just build a culture and go out there and get it. See what, what's really cool is it sounds like these, these gentlemen and women at fresh point knew the significance of enthusiasm. Uh, and what enthusiasm for the work does because it, it, it's not just you it's all the people around you and that lifts up a whole team. And they were, they were not just buying your skill, but they're also buying your enthusiasm, recruiting your enthusiasm. And I can't help but think of Johnny Caraba from a, a Caraba's Italian grill. You must've heard of it. Of course. Yeah. Um, started off as one location, just him and his, his uncle. Right. Um, but he said the one thing that really contributes to my success is my enthusiasm. I'm not the most, talented person in here but i always bring in the most energy and it's my enthusiasm to be the best that elevates everybody around me and you literally as you enter a room you're either going to bring people up or you're going to bring people down but there's going to be 
a sum equal of like all the different energy. And if you can come in there like a madman, like you do every Monday when you walk into this place, you're going to lift people up. And that, pe- that enthusiasm is so undervalued in my opinion. I agree. I, uh, it's sometimes it's exhausting, mm. you know, because now I have 125 employees who all look up to me to ensure that everything is going the right direction. Now I've switched roles, you know, now I'm that guy, that COO who's telling everybody else, yes, you can, you can yeah. do it. And I have to lead by example every yeah. single day. Yeah. Easier said than done, right? <laughs> you know, it is. Cause I, f- I have a major guilt complex, mm. you know, because a lot of my job now isn't the act of running food or busting tables, which I am happy to do all day long. A lot of it has to do with sitting in front of a computer and looking at numbers and negotiating vendor contracts and holding people accountable and and sitting down with my leaders and strategizing and all of these different things that aren't the day to day working in a restaurant, you know, and that's tough because I walk into a restaurant and I want to be part of that team. Like you guys all know I'm willing to do this, right? You want the cookie, the end result. Yeah. You know, I missed that. And so Friday and Saturday nights here are the funnest nights because I like to jump in and essentially just be like an essay, you know, a server assistant. I'm just out busting tables, running food, talking to people, That's giving out That's my favorite boys, you know? role in a restaurant, oh, by the so way. so fun. Is being, which, I mean, an essay is the first time I've heard it be explained as like a server assistant, but that just goes to show I don't have all the answers in the industry. <laughs> but just like, uh, I think the, the host position is the most underutilized position in most restaurants, but they can be an essay for everyone. Oh yeah. And it's just that role of being the host and also just being that support staff for all these other people. I love that position. Um, I'm getting derailed a little bit right now. So you're with territory, sorry, you're with fresh point as territory street sales manager, uh, for six years until 2015. So you spent some time here. Um, did you grow as a professional during this time? Anything that you weren't doing before, any new skills that are transferable to restaurant operations during this time? That was, um, that was a big, big change for me because essentially we ended up transitioning out the entire sales team and I got to hire my own team. Okay. And from start, I hired the enthusiastic people that wanted that I could tell. I liked hiring athletes. I wanted competitive people because I think in the restaurant business, there's so many people that say, I want to, I want to get out. I want to do that. I want to be the wine rep. I want to be the guy that walks in the back, shakes hands with the chef and is like, he looks like he's having fun. And I think the like the success rate on that's like four percent. You know, people go out there and they go, "Oh shit, this job's really hard." Actually, as a matter of fact, it was that role of being a, a wine rep that I was. I like when I decided I was going to go back into hospitality. Like, I was going after that, and I was like, "Shit, this is I don't want to do this. I can't." No. A lot of information. So there's a lot of wine out there you have to memorize. <laughs> so I was it's like, "That's not." Tough. Me. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that that was one of my main things there at at Fresh Point. I really learned um, a lot of leadership skills. My uh, The president of Fresh Point at the time, that guy that saw that enthusiasm, his name was Jim Williamson, and he was another mentor of mine, just an amazing man uh, who had amazing character and ethics and you know, do the right thing was his North Star. And I just was so impressed by him every day. And he taught me so much about patience and, um, and leadership and the right way to lead and things to do. Not as much like operations for a restaurant. I got really got into operations when I got to U.S. Foods. U.S. Foods was where I really, you know, we did produce and dairy, right? So I knew, I know still to this day, know more about produce than I ever should. If there's ever a produce question, it comes to me. But when I got into U.S. Foods, we started talking with the restaurant operations consultants and we started doing, as a district sales manager, we go out, off and do all these retreats The technology that U.S. Foods had was second to none and their ability to sit down with somebody and really identify how to partner with them and help them was mind blowing to me. I learned so much at that job. It was unbelievable. One of the biggest lessons, I mean, what what was going on over at U.S. Foods and I I think there's going to be a lot here that we can share that's that will be helpful for our listeners. Like what it was about the dynamic between how U.S. Foods went into a restaurant versus other suppliers. And you said it was their technology, but you also said it was their ability to collaborate and to work together. So pick it up from there. You know, I was pretty fortunate leaving Fresh Point because I was managing Memphis, Nashville, Knoxville, Bowling Green, and North Alabama. And so the reason I wanted to get out of there, uh, I had two small children at home, 
and I was gone four and a half days out of the week. Mm. Two children under two, <laughs> and uh, my wife was again. Yeah, you need to be home more. Yeah. So I had the uh, opportunity to, to interview for a few different companies, and U.S. Foods was the one company that understood their core values, and they believed in their core values. When I asked the president what their core values were, he recited the core values and said, "That's the way we live." And something about that I get really excited about because Do you I remember the core values to this day. <sighs> Putting you on the spot. Here. Walk the talk was one of them. Um, that was the main one. I, I, there, I don't. That's awesome. After five I, years, walk the talk was a big one because that was one that we always. You have to walk the talk, man. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, do it. Dude, I love that. That's the big one because our number one leading core value at Restaurant Unstoppable is integrity. In my, in my mind, that's walk, walk the talk. Yeah. Do what you say you're going to do, right? It's super powerful. I can give you my five here yeah, all day long. <laughs> but, uh, so the, the president there was great. And getting into, um, I, I just was blown away when they started. We went to, we had a couple of retreats. One was in Vegas and one was here and there. And corporate would come down with, let's help our restaurant succeed. That's our ultimate goal. And I truly believed it. I've never been somebody who's solely motivated by money. I've just been... I've always been a, if you come in and do the best job you possibly can and you genuinely care, money will follow. So you're going into these restaurants. Their motto is let, help restaurants succeed. Where, where, what was the most common thing that you would see that restaurants weren't doing and that you would help them do to help them succeed? So there's a few things. Number one is they would buy from multiple companies. You know, they would walk in and they would say, oh, we're spreadsheeting and we're, Cisco's price is this this week. And I just... Although I was biased, even today, one of the things I do at, at, with my consulting company, New Light Hospitality, is I do vendor negotiations because spreadsheeting is no, it's not the way to go. If you can sit down with all of your different vendors and you put an RFP out, a request for proposal, and you can negotiate like a three-year deal and you can give them all of your business, you can save ridiculous amounts of money. So most times people were, um, they're spreadsheeting, but another thing is they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what, they don't know how much money they're making. They don't know why they're making, they're not doing things intentionally, right? So for instance, if I walk in and I say, what item are you making the most, what item do you have the best margin on? Yeah. No, one in 10 could tell me which item it was. Yeah. They would go, a Coke. I'm like, no. Is it your, what, how much money do you make on your hamburger? And they go, I, I don't know. And how did you price it? They'd say, well, I looked at what the guy across the street is like. Well, how do you know what they pay for it? Yeah. I don't. I just priced it. Like, so I one dollar less. Why obviously. are you doing that? Yeah. Like you've got to make you have to be intentional with how you price things and why you price things. And we would do that. We would come in and we would show them a, we had a proprietary system that you could break all of that down. And it was mind blowing to put theoreticals in front of somebody. Yeah. You could say theoretically based upon your product mix and what you're using, entering all of your recipes you should be running a 28% food cost. And they go, well, shit, I'm at 37. I go, so now you know 9% of your food cost is going somewhere. Let's find it. Yeah. And that, then it, then it, all of a sudden you see in their eyes, they go, damn, I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. And that's where these large companies, the national brands are utilizing technology, food cost, back office management. It's really helping them cut their cost as well as negotiating really good deals with your vendors. They're there. Yeah. But if you're picking off from four different vendors, I, I always attribute it to like marriage. Like if I was to go to my wife or if I was to say, Hey, look, you're going to be my main wife. But when you're in a bad mood, I'm going to go to wife number two, three or four. How loyal is wife number one? Not very. But if I give everything to wife number one and I listen to wife number one and I give everything I can to them, when my walk-in goes out, guess who's got a truck out my back door? No, like, and I'm not arguing the, uh, I won't argue the logistics and the economy of what you just shared to us. But then you, the only pushback I would have is a lot of these restaurants that part of their whole brand and ethos is having lots of purveyors and going locally and trying to go straight to the source, right? And that's, so it's weird. Like, I hear what you're saying. What you're saying absolutely is going to help you tighten up your operation. But where do you draw the line for, like, I want to give my money to my friends, the people who are in my community. I want to keep it local. Like, where does that line get drawn? I think 100% you have to do that. I think it's very important to support your friends, support the local people. Yeah. Even if it costs a little bit more. 
I think so you where can, do you draw those lines? Well, I think you can get more margin out of it. Mm-hmm. You can turn around and say, we're completely local and we're buying local products. And you know what? Foods in season that are local taste better, by the way. Mm-hmm. You know, I would much rather buy zucchini and squash that was grown right down the street in the season than something from Salinas that's traveled across the country on a semi that's hydro-cooled. It's not going to be as good. Yeah. Your friend and my friend, Hal Holdenbach, over at Lachlan Table, he said, I said, how, how do you make basic vegetables taste this good? He says, I buy local food in season yeah. when it's at the peak of its freshness yeah. from great farmers. Yeah. Always, always do that. I'm a big fan of that. But where are you buying plastic film? Your local plastic film doesn't exist, I don't think. Yeah. Um, fry oil, whatever you're, the, the, there's a broad liner that you're using and you're picking them off between two or three because you're already spreadsheeting between these four other people. I'm just a fan of re- building relationships with your vendors and it being a, a, a 50-50 win-win situation because so many times the restaurateur feels they win when the, the, the vendor loses, and that's not good. That's – and, like, literally, like, yeah. Like, why – why the, I don't know. My mind's are kind of, like, exploding right now because that you're absolutely right. And, like, this is some of the shit that I'm trying to – when I say transform the industry, yeah. inject better values into the industry, it's not about any like business done right. Nobody loses. It's a win-win. If anything, it's okay for you to lose sometime if you know that other person's going to win because long-term, you know, them winning means you win too, right? Yeah. You know, I need six deliveries a week. Well, every time I make a delivery, it costs us $100. If you could do three deliveries, I could shave off $300 in margin for you. But I mean, there's, there's so many things like that. I've yeah. talked to so many people and I said, well, what's good for you? Do you want me to buy exclusive brands if you need me to buy there? Do you need me to get my delivery a little bit later? What does your delivery schedule look like? And they look at me like I'm speaking a different language and they go, what do you mean? You actually care about our, tr-? Like, well, yeah, I understand that routes are tough and everybody wants their delivery between six and eight. What if I get it at 10? If I get it at 10 on Tuesdays and Thursdays and you just see them light up and like nobody wants that. And I go, can you give me a better deal if I do that? And they go, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're helping us out a ton. Yeah. It's, and it's, so many people just die on that rock. They're like, no, damn it. I need Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m. It's like, that's a prime delivery window for anybody. You're going to pay more. Yeah. And then you're going to call and complain about your pricing. Like you're asking, when do you get to walk on a car lot and go, I want the soup to nuts, the best car, but it also needs to be the cheapest. Yeah. You I don't mean, have that. Exactly. I mean, and you're, Win-win, one of those seven habits of highly effective people, right? Stephen R. Covey, Covey, right there. Huge. you, you got to create – and even better, if you can create a win-win-win situation where three people win, even better. All and day. it's possible. Um, great stuff. I mean, I, I kind of want to get into – you said after um, U.S. Foods, you were you're consulting in, in basically like your strongest suit as a consultant – or as a consultant, I should say, <laughs> um, was price negotiation, getting into all of that. So I think there's probably a lot we can do. You're already dropping gold on us on just thinking win-win and like literally caring about the person you're doing business with, yeah. the person you have a relationship with, right? That's all businesses is relationships. Um, but is there anything you want to unpackage in regards to U.S. Foods? I'm actually secretly really excited that you mentioned U.S. Foods organically and gave them a plug and like a – a, a badge of like respect or like a, the approval because unofficially they've been in touch with me about sponsoring the show and hey. I have these rules about you got to be recommended to me organically and even when great companies like U.S. Foods I'm like I have rules you know but I'm gonna reach out to them now I'm like guess what check out this episode yeah <laughs> no I, I was real impressed I was real impressed with everybody over at U.S. Foods and it was actually the owner of this restaurant uh, that we're in now Stephen Smithing that pulled me away from them. Uh, he kind of got me into a meeting with him to talk about lunch. He said, I want to talk about operations. I need some help with some different things. And I thought I'm going to get, cause I had, I'd sold him food for 15 years. He's been one of my favorite customers. He's always ran as building the, my best customers I've ever had. And I thought I'm finally going to get in there. Us foods. Here we go. And, uh, and after the second meeting with him, I went, you're not trying to buy food from me you're trying to hire me, aren't you? And he was kind of like, hey, you got me. And um, and I, from there, we kind of it started collaborating. And he goes, look, this is what this is our vision. This is what I think we can do. And he's in a group called Vistage. And he had said, in that group, they asked him, they said, if you could call one person today who you think could help your business immediately, who is it? 
and then go call them. And he goes, there's only one person I could think of, of all of my years that really could come into my business today and help me. And it was you, which I'm obviously a super flattered him. to hear and humbled to even hear somebody say something like that. But I was like, man, I work nine to five. Like my, I'm a, I'm on, I'm on conference calls all day, Mondays and Fridays. Like I don't really have to leave. It's, it's kind of nice. And I, they pay me pretty well. And, um, but ultimately I couldn't deny wanting to come in and work with these restaurants. And, and so Steven actually pulled me away from us foods. I, I didn't want to leave us foods. Us foods was a, a great company. So he said, if there was anybody that I, the one person I could go to that could turn this business around, that could help me, it would be you. Did he ever tell you why you, yeah, I think that we've done one of my guests coming on this week. His name is William Jameson. He's with a company called Culture Index. And we've really done a lot of studying into personality types. So Jim Collins, good to great, right? You want to get the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm. You get the right people on the bus and everybody rowing in the right direction. You have a 100% chance to succeed versus putting a hodgepodge of people and trying to see if they all work together. So he knew exactly what he was looking for. He knew his personality and what his strengths were and what his weaknesses were. And I was kind of the other side of that, the yin to his yang. And he goes, I feel like you'd be the perfect person to be the anti me. We work so well together. We have this amazing trust together, but I need a number two. And if you, if you're, are you familiar with Gina Wickman book traction? I am. From, I'm aware of it. I confuse that a lot with scaling up. I don't think I've listened to it yet, but it's been you, recommended to me. Traction. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's really a visionary and I'm the integrator. Yeah. And where he is a visionary to bring me in to really be the integrator was exactly what he needed. And from there, uh, when I came on, it just, all of a sudden it was just like, Hey, this, this is perfect. I'm hijacking your story right now. Let's because go. Of like it, it, you're hitting a, a serious chord with me. And literally I just looked over at Jared to see if he was listening to what you were saying. And I don't even know if he knows, we were literally having this conversation on our drive down to Nashville from New Hampshire where I'm like, dude, I need, I need my, my opposite person. I was like, I'm ready to scale this thing. Yeah. I was like, but I'm not the person to do it. Like I'm not good at the shit that we have to be good at to scale this thing. I'm not detail oriented. I'm not a manager. I was like, I'm a visionary person. I'm a dreamer. I'm a enthusiastic. I, I, I influence other people to do things. Like I'm not good at the detail. I'm fucking dyslexic. I have like all the, like, you know what I mean? Like I just, <laughs> I should not touch detail. Bad things happen. You know, it does not come out good. Uh, this is not me. So like I'm, I'm putting this out there right now that if, if you think what I do is cool, restaurant podcast media and you are a detail oriented manager builder architect reach out to me because i need help i'm not saying that i'm gonna say yes but like i need to start putting it out there and finding my opposite person i don't know who that person is yet so culture next is a great way to figure that it's like a disc profile but you can kind of create that yeah. profile of the person the, all the different characteristics that you want somebody to have and then you just put it out there people take this quiz and you yeah. can find the person who has all those exact qualities that you need. We do every single person that we hire at both yeah. of our restaurants does a culture index survey. And we have a perfect survey of the type of person we want to wait tables, the perfect survey person to be a bartender, a bar manager, service manager, director of operations, general manager. We've created kind of our, our perfect profile of the temperament and the type of person for each individual role. So when somebody comes in to apply for that job, they do the culture index and we look at it and see how much of a, a fit they are. Uh, it's it's and been, what's the culture index you use if, we, if we're sending people to that resource right now to start this process, where do they go? It's called culture index, CI, it's, CU, it's cultureindex.com, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, William Jameson, if, if you check out Nashville Restaurant Radio, you can go to nashvillerestaurantradio.com and you can hear the interview with William Jameson. I'm sure by the time this comes out, that episode will be out. You, you got me wanting to talk to this William Jameson as well after that conversation. He's going to be in Nashville this week. Is he really? Yes. Oh, man. We're going to make it happen. It'll be your Thursday and Friday. Um, damn. <laughs> I mean, thank you for letting me do a little job post in the middle of your story. Because, but I, you, I think, but again, back to how we started this conversation, you got to put it out there. You know, you got to put the, like, you know, you got to share what you need. And if you don't put it out there, then how does the universe know what to give you? Right. Yeah. No, I think it's fun. I'm having a good time being on the other side of the microphone. You're doing I mean, great, man. Most of the time I'm constantly trying to think of the next question. So it's kind of fun having the questions thrown at me. And I do that. I do that shit all the time. I'm like, them like a shortstop right now. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, so back. Okay. So, so U.S. Foods, um, you leave the U.S. Foods, you get recruited to become the director of operations for Green Hills Grill. 
uh, where you are the director of operations today. And you've also in that time since 2018, when you started as a director of operations, two years later, you started national restaurant radio. And now uh, shortly off the heels of that, you took on, you started wearing the hat for a second location, director of operations, new light hospitality, Solutions, which is wait no, that's your consulting firm. I'm jumping yeah. all over the place right now. I have Green Hills Grill Maribels. and Maribels, Maribels are my two Thank restaurants you. here, and I oversee both of them. And then I have a consulting company that's called New Light Hospitality. Well, really, it's a operations consulting where I help people come in. I help them identify. Really, it's where people don't have core values and they don't really know what they're doing. So many people come to work every day. They have a great idea for a restaurant. And they come in. And they don't really know how to lead or they're hiring people at random. They think, hey, they know this one guy. But I think it's really difficult when you have a leadership team that isn't all following the same rules. You know, so that's where we identify what their core values are. What are the things? How are you going to hire people and how are you going to fire people based upon what criteria? Right or wrong? Is, is there a gray area? What are you doing? I think from there, it's kind of like that baseline jumping off. What do you need to do? And then we look at who they're buying from, what their buying habits are. And we can look at, there's just a, there's a, there's a bunch of different aspects of that. I don't do that very as much. It's really kind of a once in a blue moon, I'll help somebody out. I don't even like yeah. charge for it. I mean, really. If you, if you really love that sort of thing and you're not familiar with it yet, I want to give this gentleman a shout out. Tom Walter, past guest in the show, founder of uh, tasty catering, I believe is the company out of Chicago. Uh, he wrote this book called it's my company too. And from, I mean, I, you know, so important to have alignment of core values, vision, all those things that you were just talking about. Entangled organization is what he calls it. And to date, in my opinion, it's the best explanation of how to create what you're talking about, where everybody in that organization is empowered to call out anybody else, no matter where they are. It's a, it's a flat hierarchy yeah. where like, we all know the core values. We all know the vision. I don't care if you're the CEO, you're not doing what we said we're here to do. Right. And like, yeah. It's a great, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. Anybody who's listening to this who wants to do what, uh, what you just shared with us, like that idea of getting people alignment around core values. But then you said you really shine with again, the purchasing. So, I mean, you've already kind of given us tips around purchasing and how you, but what would your process be when you would go into a restaurant to see how you could turn around their processes for purchasing? I think you have to ask them what they're current, what they're doing intentionally at the time. And I think when people start rattling off all the different vendors they use and how they got this guy here and how they got that guy there, it really takes, I can do that as somebody who works for us foods or somebody who works for Cisco. I can come in and have this conversation, but it doesn't work because I have a vested interest in you switching everything to me. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a person coming in without a, a dog in the hunt, just a, Let's see what you can do if you commit everything to one person and you become a, a collaborator, a partnership versus this dictatorship that you're in right now and see how that doesn't change your life. Um, it helps a lot. I mean, I, and it, every single time I've done it, the people have come out of the end of it and they go, wow, I am saving so much money now and my rep comes by twice as much and they have ideas for me and I feel like now they're a partner and when I did this deal here at this restaurant, I gave the rep $100 each month. The rep, at the end of the whole thing, I said, I want you in both of my restaurants, everything. I gave him $100 each restaurant in perpetuity of this deal. I said, I want you to bring your family in. This isn't just a one way, I'm getting everything from you. I, I want you to be in the restaurant. I want you to see menu changes. I want you to see, I want you to tell me if the food isn't good. I want you to tell me if the service isn't good. And they've done it. We, we use Gordon food service here right now. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done an amazing job. And this was after I left us foods, I did an RFP here and us foods didn't win by the way, which was a tough one. Yeah. I mean, you, when you do that and these other companies, I had really heard know, great things about Gordon's food. Too. I, you know what? Gordon food service, uh, has done. They're, they're absolutely amazing. They have done a wonderful, wonderful job. Yeah. But I mean, just listening to you talk, it sounds like the first things you do with your uh, new light consulting company is that you look at prime costs. You're looking at labor, which is the cultural aspect of it. Like the basic, the basic the, the biggest expense when it comes to labor is training new people. So if you hire right, you don't have that turnover. You're gonna, your labor, I feel like 
you're just going to do better. Like it's, it's, it's expensive to train people. Right. And it then is. right after that, it's your cost of goods sold. I mean, maybe right there back and forth, cost of goods sold labor. Those are your prime costs. Like you're just going after prime costs, like right off the top. And it's what's, it's what can you control? Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and me being an alcoholic, right. The, the thing that I think the most impactful thing that I've learned through this whole process is the serenity prayer. I mean, if you, if you really break it down, right, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. While that's something that you can hear, you can say, and it goes over really breaking that down is like the best life advice you could ever have. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's around this time that you got sober on that note. Cause you, you, it would have been 2019 if you're two years sober this month. It's, that is correct. Yeah. So wh- where did this happen? I mean, was it on your way out of, um, well, you joined director of operations, uh, Green Hills, 2018, July. So a little over a year of, of being back in the restaurant business, you decided it was time to get sober. What was there a triggering event? There was, uh, it's funny. You, you put the math together there on that. Well, uh, you know, the, you're like, Hey, well, that something's not right here. Well, Two years ago, <laughs> we missed a triggering event. There was a Thank October, for- October 28th, uh, 2019. Um, yeah. I had been sick for a while. I'm not going to go into too many details, but I'll give you the gist of it. I'd been sick with a with a with some kind of lung issue. It's not COVID, I don't think. Uh, it would have been COVID-18. Really it? early. It was 19. <laughs> oh, 19. That's right. It would have been really early. Um, and I was at, a, I was at a, a work event. And I don't think I, it escaped the lab at that point, though. Do what? <laughs> so I don't think it escaped the lab at that no, point. No. No. As I was say, it definitely <laughs> wasn't. Uh, but I had gone to a specialist, and they had said I had an elevated diaphragm. I didn't know what that meant. I, I Googled it, which is not something you ever want to do. And I got that uh, set of basically I had lung cancer and I was going to die and all of these things. But I had this big event I was at and I drank an entire bottle of Woodford at this How event. How did you get lung cancer from drinking alcohol? It was an elevated diaphragm was oh. what the, what the, what the, uh, the doctor, the pulmonologist told me. And I was going to go to my primary care doctor the next day. But I had to go to this event, and I was like, well, if I do it, I'm going to start drinking. And I got uh, way, way, way too drunk, which, you know, I guess I guess can happen. And I'm, I'm never the let's have one drink, let's have two drinks, let's have ten. Yeah. I've, people would give me these wine cork toppers. They'd be like, oh, these are really cool. And I'm like, what the fuck? I don't – I'm never going to leave half a bottle of wine. Yeah. I'm going to finish the wine. There's, I don't need a cork topper. Come on. It's the silliest <laughs> gift in the world for me. Uh, but that night, um, I, I got way too blackout drunk, and I made a bad decision. Um, and it was a bad decision. Shit. I mean, it was... It was I had a... Uh, how do you say it? I'm so... You caught me off guard. I haven't really told this story before. Um, I... Um, just start I hooked up with an employee. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. On that night, and um, it was the next morning, uh, and everybody knew, everybody knew that I had, and it was a really bad situation, and I was, uh, it was terrible. Told my wife everything. You know, it was just one of those days where you wake up and you go, "I'm never gonna drink again," and that morning I said, "I'm never gonna drink again," and I didn't. Um, I actually resigned my position here at the restaurant because of it, because yeah. it just was too much of a distraction. And I focused on me. Um, the owner of the restaurant was a saint. He obviously were, we're best friends. We, we needed each other. We had a lot of plans. And this was a tough blow for him and his family because they, they own this restaurant. And I immediately uh, went to, it was two days later when that happened. And during the conversation that he had with me where where I I officially said, look, I'm going to step down. A gigantic rainbow happened. This rainbow was the biggest, brightest rainbow I've ever seen in my entire life. We're sitting outside, not raining, but all of a sudden there's this huge rainbow. And I just, I'm not like the most religious person, but if God has ever spoke to you and said, Hey, look, it's going to be okay. Like the, the, the floods are done, dude, no, go, go get your life together was that moment I saw that rainbow and I just went you know what I'm I, I, I hit rock bottom you know I think that's one of the things they say you gotta do is you gotta hit rock yeah. bottom and the next day I went to an AA meeting it was that night actually that night I went to an AA meeting for the first time and I was scared and I was crying um 
my wife was very unhappy with me. Imagine. And I sat in this room of people and I had people say, you don't need that, man. You don't need that shit. You're just going to go in there and there's going to be a bunch of people that have like drove their car into school buses. And you're not like that. You're not like that. And it was a meeting. It was a birthday meeting. And a birthday meeting is where they, at the end of the month, they, they celebrate annual sobriety benchmarks. And there was a guy in the meeting who said, three years ago, I lost my job, almost lost my wife, almost lost my kids. And due to the power of, of, of A, I have all of those things. And I'm, my career is booming and all of these things. And I just lost it. And that was, yeah, that, that hits close to home for you. I mean, that was, it was your, everything. Your storyline. As far as people telling me that I don't need to do that, I don't think there was one place in this world I needed to be more than was in that room. And I felt for the first time in a really long time, like I was in a group of people, I was safe. I was safe. Nobody is, nobody is judging me. When I thought every single person in the world hated me, in the worst moment of my life, I walked into that room and every single person put their arm around me and said it was okay. Mm. It's okay, brother. It's okay. And it, it was one of those magical moments for me that I just said, you know what? It's, it's done. I'm never, I'm never going to make a decision again in my life that wasn't a decision I would have made so- sober. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to wake up the next morning and go, wow, fuck, I hate that. Why did I do that? I mean, I, I, somebody who studies habit, the power of habit being one book that I've read in uh, Atomic Habits, uh, they, they reference in, in the power of habit the one of the reasons why AA is so effective and it's because of the community. It's because like it there's a lot of triggers. They say habits are usually triggered by a person or a place, right? So you, you have this routine where you go around certain people and around certain places and that's going to trigger for you. That was this event that you went to or you're around certain people and you're, and you're celebrating something. It was an event that triggered a habit. Um, so when you remove the, the places and the habits from your routine and you replace them with a bunch of people who you know are not going to drink, well, that's the hope, the hope at least, um, <laughs> that that you get to re- you, you, ch- you, you keep your habits, but you replace the location and the people. So you, you eliminate the trigger, basically. Well, and one of the one of the many reasons why AA works. One of the the thing for me, the thing for me that really works is that I drinking a lot of people who are alcoholics, drinking isn't the problem. It's the solution. Okay, so we all have problems. Uh, if you're more, if you have more of an addictive brain or the alcoholic's brain, what happens is something's not okay in your life. You're trying to avoid an feeling escape. something. You yeah. need to escape. And so, what I learned that day was that I had, I had demons. I had these things. I had trauma. I never really recognized that I had, and that's where the that's where they have these twelve steps. You go through, you know, admitting that you have a problem and all these different things, but really delving into um, why I was drinking in the first place was probably because like, at some point it turned from like, "Hey, I like to drink with my friends," to now I've been married fifteen years and I'm drinking because I'm trying to escape something. Yeah. It's not, it, was, it wasn't the same experience. And yeah. when I finally was able to figure that out, when I was finally able to sit down and talk about it, um, it was amazing because that, that feeling, that needing to drink just kind of went away, mm-hmm. knowing that if I do drink, I'm back in that place where I make a decision that isn't my own. It's a decision I made based on alcohol. Yeah. I meditate every day. I think sitting down and being mindful. I go hike. I try and hike every single day. And when I go hiking, it's my time to let my brain go. I start listening. To, I, you're, you go hiking with me a lot, by the way. Oh, man, let's go for a real hike sometime so, and have a conversation. We're in town for five more days. <laughs> if we got to do it. it I literally get on the trail and I turn on an episode. I listened to your episode with Josh Copel the other day. It was fantastic. I've Thank used you. many, many parts of that in lineups. I'm a little embarrassed week. by that episode because I, I got confused at one point. But it's I, okay. I recovered. I recovered. <laughs> so what I do is though I start walking and I start listening to any of your episodes or whatever book I'm listening to and it's an hour an hour and a half walk and about 20 to 30 minutes in my brain usually is off on 14 other I'm, my, I'm just way gone and I turn it off and I just walk and I let my brain just go that's yeah. my ideation time I just yeah I just stop and I do it and there's a place I stop and I meditate on the side of this mountain and it's just it's amazing I never had that before I never knew to take a little time for myself. How long do you meditate for? 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. 
and not not a whole long time. I mean, this is resonating with me a lot right now, honestly, um, because I, I have a very similar morning routine. I try to wake up. The first thing I try to do is go for a walk around my bike or do like walk run is what I call it. Yeah. It's like six miles. <laughs> like I'll get there eventually on my yeah. own pace. Um, and then I try to meditate right after. And um, my meditation is only at three minutes right now, honestly, because I, I'm because of the book Atomic Habits. Like they say, just start really small. It's about developing the routine, not how well you execute the elements of the routine. Sure. But just going through the Every motions. Day. So I'm intentionally making my goals with the exception of the working out super short. So I just develop a routine. Well, that's smart. And it's, it's super powerful, man. And uh, it's, it's very good stuff. And I, I usually warn all my guests before we, get re- we hit record. And I say to him, like, I ask personal questions. I'm not trying to be a dick. Yeah. I ask these personal questions because that's where a lot of the answers are for people. And not enough of this conversation happens. And the more we know about your perspective the more we can identify it the more we can help people right so 100%. you said that you're that you're you're talking about alcoholism and you said most people the i can't remember exactly how you said it but they're usually trying to escape something yeah there's a there's some form of their personality some trauma something that you have to feel yeah you know when i first quit drinking the first two months i meditated every day because I, I was very anxious all the time and i i had no i had no freaking clue how much i was drinking well, it's relative. No, you, well, no, right? I mean, like, I never drank in the daytime. I wasn't like I get up in the morning and drink kind of a yeah, guy. So but six six, what? Uh, two sixty, yeah, two six, like, six, like, six, six two you're six, big dude. But like, I, 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 I had a bottle of like vodka, a half gallon of vodka in the freezer in the garage, and so, I would get home and I would open like a Lacroix from the garage, and then I would take that bottle of vodka, I'd take a big sip of Lacroix, fill it with that vodka, but every three or four days. I'd have to refill that vodka with the bottle that I had in my lawnmower's uh, grass catcher that I had hiding in there. And I would refill it because my wife went in the freezer. I don't want her to see that. I drank almost a whole half gallon in three days. Yeah. It's like when you start, and I just normal. I did that. And I was like, well, that's just because I didn't you want her to know. You're like, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's really, that's really bad. I shouldn't. I, you start realizing these things. But when I started having feelings, I started having emotions. And I didn't have a way to escape them. So this is what was I was power. getting into. It was really powerful. What was it that you were trying to escape? And I know that's a very personal question. And if that's something that is not anybody's <clears throat> business, then you don't have to answer it. But I think that if we can t- discuss it, it might sure strike a little deeper. I, I think a lot of it has to do with growing up. I have an older brother. I'm the I'm a middle child. Yeah. Um, my wife's a middle child. Um, she has she has some stuff too that gets projected upon me, and then just my feeling of not being good enough. Mm. Um, I think that I have an older brother who's two and a half years older than me, and he's six eight three ten. He's a big dude. Yeah, and puny, aren't you? my younger sister, she's six foot tall. She's and they're both amazing people, but I was always kind of the the one in the middle who got left out, who was constantly trying to be as good as his older brother, who was way bigger, way faster, way stronger, my entire life. Yeah. But I could never do the things that he could. And I had, you know, grandparents once I'd tell me, you're never going to be as good as your brother. You're never going to be this. Mm-hmm. You're never going to be that. And I just tried so damn hard to make everybody else proud. And I I just didn't feel like it was working. I just wasn't good enough. And there was a moment where I had to stop and go, hey, all that shit doesn't mean anything, man. Yeah. Like, you're, you are good enough. It's okay. It's almost like the uh, like a Stuart Smalley episode, you know, like the you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. Yeah. But it was real. It was one of those things for me that I had to kind of I had to own, and I had to sit down, I had to work through, and I had to read books, and I had to talk to people, and I got a sponsor, and I went to meetings, and I listened, I listened. Damn, I listened. I'm I'm not good at listening, and I started <laughs> listening yeah. to people. Uh, And I started a podcast and I started a podcast with this new, I started a company called New Light Hospitality as my new light. Mm -hmm. And my logo has a gigantic rainbow on it. I saw that. As you look at it, it's not a, like an LGBT. I was curious. No, no, it's not. It's, it is about my new light in life. And I'm going to starting over with positivity and good vibes and help. And I just want to help others and whatever I can do. So new light with the rainbow, you the the best part about the rainbow is that if you think it is that, then awesome. Like I am all inclusive. I love everybody. <laughs> I hope, you know, I hope people look at me and they go, "Oh, he must." So like, That's me, man. I'm, I'm in. Let's yeah. go. Uh, so when I had I had kind of a small focus group of people that I asked what they thought of it, and they're like, "Well, it looks like you're gay," and I was like, "Great." <laughs> I, I 
I don't care. That's <laughs> it's I my to thing. a broader market. <laughs> yeah, man, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. So that was the whole thing. So that's my new light hot. The whole story behind new light hospitality was in that in between moment. Um, and my first two clients were these two restaurants. Mm. They both said, "Dude, we need you. We love you." And they put their arms around me. That's why the owner of this restaurant, um, best friend in the world. And I there's a there's a a line in the movie Meet Joe Black where he says what is love? And he said, love is knowing the worst thing about somebody and it's okay. Mm. And acceptance. That's the way I feel about the people in this restaurant. They're not only my best friends, but they know the worst thing about me. I can be myself 100% authentic myself around them and anything around them. And they love me. The truth will set you free, man. I say it all the time. It's amazing. I say it all the time. It's hard because your truths can be scary. Yeah, you know, frightening, and you're Everybody afraid people. Has yeah, you don't you don't want people to, you know, turn you away for whatever your truths are, like trauma, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, thank you for getting so open. Thank you for really being vulnerable there. I really appreciate it. it. Does make the content strike harder. It does make us learn. It does. I think it does a lot when we get that vulnerable. So thank you for going there. Well, it's been um, the best. It's been the best thing in my life. We only have 13 minutes left together, man. That's how fast time is going. And I don't know if you can give me a little more time, but I do want to talk Let's about. Go. What you're going on right now? Uh, if you have to, you know, start wrapping up, just give me the the, the silent cues, and I'll I'll be moving fast. But uh, I do want to give time to talk about what you got going on with uh, your podcast, Nashville Restaurant Radio. Um, from what I understand, I've listened to it. I have to admit that I do not listen to other industry podcasts, and the reason why I don't do it is because I don't want to be influenced by what other people are creating. That's just my. That's like what I tell myself. I like to listen to stuff outside of the industry. Sure. And people who I think are movers and shakers for like the world and not so much in the restaurant industry. Cause I think the restaurant industry, there's a little bit of a bubble, you know, and we compare ourselves to each other, but we need to start thinking outside of the industry and looking to other industries for inspiration. Right? Sure. Um, but anyway, from what I understand, I listened to a, a, one of our, your episodes um, and we have a very similar like mission to just learn and to share knowledge and to share stories, and to share perspective. You're doing it at a hyper local a concentrated level within Nashville. You go outside of Nashville occasionally, but one one of the things I was really interested and curious to discuss today is what's happening in Nashville after because you give so much focus to one geographic. What what are the trends here? What's happening? What are the pain points? What's the dialogue? What's the conversation? Well, there's a lot of questions there. Um, what I can see the thing that's the difference or the unique thing about Nashville is collaboration that the community of Nashville chefs and restaurateurs, especially the local and independent side, were very welcoming. You know, when people come to town, it's not, oh, that asshole's coming to town, they're gonna take my business. Like, we invite them in to come eat at our restaurant and say, if you need a cup of milk, let me know. Yeah. You know, we, it's the number one thing that I get from people who come into Nashville and I say, what's the most unique thing? They go, we feel like everybody just like is so nice. Like, people should be mean to us coming in. <laughs> And I go, no, that, that, that's what we do here. That's what we're trying to change. We're right? trying yeah. to be, we, we want to welcome people into the community. And there's a lot of people that are coming from California, Chicago, New York, D.C., everywhere. And we want to put our arms around them and say, we want you here, but we want you to now be a beacon like we are. And it's been so fun and exciting. And you'll see it as you're here all week, kind of talking to people. The community is big. We've had the pandemic has been something that's brought everybody even closer together. So many pop ups. I don't. I don't know about all the other cities. Is there as many pop ups going on in other towns? I don't know, man. But I'm. I'm. I, I encourage people to do as many pop ups. Like if you're looking to get into this industry, I think pop ups are the way to go. Honestly, like because like is this the best way to test out markets? It's the best way to yeah. figure out if that's what you want to do. I think pop ups are the new uh, food trucks. You it's know, like hundred. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. All these restaurants on Sunday and Monday nights. So it's really funny. You, that episode with Josh Couple that I was, was referencing, he said one of the major things is Sunday and Monday nights. People spend so much time focused on what do we need to do on Sunday and Monday nights when they have all this business Friday and Saturday nights. Like, make that better. Yeah. Expand that. The night that you have all that revenue, make that your biggest night. Bump and, your mic up for me just a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, make make that your biggest yeah. night. Oh, there you go. That's much yeah, better. Crazy, right? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> make that your biggest night. And so there's a lot of pop-ups that are happening on Sunday and Monday nights here around Nashville. There's been some real, this big boom of authentic Mexican 
people are buying, they have their own mills and they're doing the Nixtamel uh, method and they're bringing in corn from Oaxaca and they're milling their own masa. They're making tortillas. There's some really amazing things going here with Alabrije and uh, Maiz de la Vida. There's a guy who does focaccia pizza. They're called Svinciones, uh, at St. Vito's Focaccia. But he's doing that on Sunday nights at a restaurant called Hathorn. And then at Bastion, which is a strategic hospitality, they're hosting Alabrije. And they're hosting a Japanese pop-up at the Patterson House called Kisser. And these re- they're they're just hosting all but, of these people okay. around town. So this is this is why I want to have this conversation because I knew that you and I sitting at a table sharing what what people are doing. What is what's the benefit of that, right? I, you know, I think that we all we all you know, rising tides raises all ships. Yes. Right. So I mean, supporting each other and helping each other. For us out here at this restaurant, I want to start doing pop ups on Sunday nights simply because we're closed on Sunday nights yeah. and we're in Brentwood which is a kind of a sleepy little town. We've just been featured on the, uh, the big Netflix show or HBO plus with the, uh, the cult right down the street right here. Oh, I, I you gotta no, check I it out. Follow. It's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, I want people to know where we are. Yeah. First of all, I'd love to support somebody to bring them in here and show them say, what do you want to do? Do your food here. But I'd love to bring people from other parts of town to let people know that we're even here. I mean, yeah. it's great marketing for us. And if I can give back, a little bit to somebody else. I mean, one of our core values here is we love our community, right? And that's twofold. We love our community, internal community of the people that work here, as well as the people that are in our, we don't have nothing if we don't have the community. So giving back is something that we try and do on a regular basis. This whole month is breast cancer. We've partnered with the Tennessee breast cancer coalition, and we're donating 10% of all of our sales every Monday night of the month. There's five of them to these people. And we're asking for donations all month long. This is for women in the area who have breast cancer, who it doesn't go to research. It goes to supporting women who can't afford it, right? They can't afford groceries. They can't afford their light bill because they are have supposed to be medical bills. So this Tennessee Breast Cancer Coalition helps support them. And we're supporting that. We want to give back to our local community. We'll do the same thing next month for men's health. But like, that's just, that's why you would do it. I want to support other chefs that yeah. are coming up. You can't afford a food truck. Well, hey, look, I've got a 7,500 square foot house with nine private dining rooms and a big, big ass kitchen. Come use it, man. I don't care. I'm not going to charge you a thing. Just come use my facilities. Have a good time. But build your brand. I loved it. I loved it. I would, the best thing is if they were they made it big and they got their start doing pop-ups at my restaurant. It would be the greatest thing in the it, world. Like the, exactly. I mean, but also there's something to, that it, go, it comes around. Like, think about it. If you're a successful restaurateur, you have all these assets, all this space, and one of your biggest challenges right now is finding good people. You know, if you provide an opportunity for people, you bring people into your space and you don't look at them as competition, but maybe your future collaborators, sure. you know, your future business partners, and like the more you give, the more you get. The more the, this this industry, and I think all business is about creating opportunity for others. That's the game. How can I help enough other people where it comes back around for me, right? And I think pop ups is one of the best ways to support the next generation of professionals to to broaden your network to get perspective to see what other people are doing to share knowledge like why not do it what what's what is the downside is there one i mean no. it takes a lot of energy it's 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 you got to coordinate it and like all that but there's a lot of benefit there what else is happening in nashville <sighs> growth growth Huge. it just crazy amounts of growth it kind of reminds me of austin 10 years ago yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, I think they say it's growing at a hundred people a day. It's crazy. So I'm moving to Nashville and we're getting, I, I love some of the restaurants we've got. John George has got a new restaurant in the Hermitage Hotel. Uh, Tony and Kathy Montuano, who were, um, famous many years in Chicago at, um, what the hell can I think of it now? I don't know. He, um, he was a dozen, dozen James Beard nominations he won in 2005. But there's just so many chefs that are coming to town and so many amazing things that are happening in Nashville. And I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. I just I, it, what, what excites me when I look at uh, markets like Nashville or Austin is that they're like almost like uh, test subjects for what's happening in so many other markets right now. But these other markets are just on the cusp. And I think what we're learning, what's happening across the nation is people are spreading out. I think COVID triggered it. But I also think that people are realizing I don't need to go to the big city anymore opportunity because over the past 10 years all this new opportunity has emerged digitally and you can be anywhere you can work from anywhere i'd rather go to a, an underserved market and be the best 
then go to a, a saturated market and have to compete with all these people who are already established. If you want opportunity, go to a, I call them fringe markets, markets that are on the, the outskirts. My good friend Chris Dimmick calls them momentum markets because he thinks that that sounds better. And they are momentum markets. Try sure. to find, like, he's in Dayton, Ohio. You know, like, there's good bones in that city. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of structure there. What happened in, like, the, the turn of the, the, I think it was, like, the 20th century? Like, the, like basically, people started getting out of these small cities because the, the, the what's the word? I should probably know more about this before I start trying to. <laughs> but, like, um, the industrial age was coming to an end, right? And like people had to go to the big cities to survive, so like these, these medium-sized cities just kind of got left behind, and the bones are still there. These mill buildings are still there. People are you can move into that space. There's just there's just vacancy everywhere. There's and people are moving to these cities because they want their they want to stretch their dollar further. Like there's a really special thing happening right now. I guess where I'm going with this is like seek out those markets. You know, like like there's so much opportunity. I think that. Again, to come full circle, Nashville is an example of one of these markets that exploded over the past 10 years. If you can get in early and you can be at the, the leading edge of one of those momentum markets, I don't know. There's just so much opportunity. I think people think of the big cities, but there's more opportunity in small cities now. You know, I think there's opportunity anywhere. Yeah. Honestly, and I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I think that people forget about the fundamentals of running a restaurant and I'm kind of old school. Yeah. That anywhere you go, if you provide amazing service and you serve hot food hot and you serve cold food cold, you know, you can win. I mean, you don't have to yeah. have, look at Arnold's downtown Nashville, Arnold's meat and three, right? It's James Beard award winning, but it's just a tiny little meat and three mm -hmm. and he serves roast beef. But every day he walked, you see Khalil at the front door and he's going, Hey, good to see you. And John Prine ain't there every day. And, all these people, but it's just, it's a Nashville melting pot and it's just, it's roast beef and cream corn and mashed potatoes, mm. but they're just slammed and it's not even in a better part of town. There's something he said for genuine hospitality. Yeah. And I think that that's for me, no matter what market you're in, I think sometimes we lose, lose sight of the fundamentals and just the basics of running a restaurant and full hands in full hands out, hot food, hot, cold food, cold, use really good ingredients and be welcoming and warm. And those are the things to me that Nashville has. Yeah. Nashville gets. They get that. And most, I mean, there's places everywhere that are not great. For the most part, you come into Nashville and everybody's friendly. You genuinely feel like they want you in the building. Mm. You know, I went to, I was in Boston a couple weeks ago and. You didn't call me? <laughs> are you from Boston? I'm in South New Hampshire, but I mean, uh, the, the states are so small up there. It's basically around the corner. We did a weekend. It was our 16 year wedding. We did a weekend in, in Boston, but like you go places and people just. I wouldn't have been welcome in that. They're case. not friendly. <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah. there was a lot of places that were, I mean, just, we were in the, the South Bay side and a lot of places were nice, but like there's people that just. What do you want? It's like, I I'm sorry, what? Excuse me? <laughs> and everybody here is, hey, no, it's, I'm happy to help you. What can I do? And first thing people say when they when they come to Nashville is, man, everybody's so nice here. And that that's kindness, man. Like, yeah. we, we want to continue that. It's kind of part of our culture here, yeah. and it works. I'm loving our conversation. I, if it was up to me, we would continue it, but I want to respect your time. I know you, you might have somebody coming in real soon. Um, before we go to the speed round, then we're going to make it a true speed round. I ask oh, wow. all my guests, uh, our mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. How have you transformed? I think we're going to transform the industry one person at a time. So how have you transform, transformed over your 20-plus years being in this industry? Who are you today versus the man you were back in the day, aside from sober? Um, I've transformed from listening. I've learned how to listen. I've learned how to listen before I speak. and depends on who you ask. I've been able to build empathy for people. Empathy to me is something that I didn't possess for so long. And once I recognize that um, every, the world doesn't revolve around me, uh, really listening to other people and gaining other people's perspectives, my level of patience that I have and the ability to listen is probably one of my strongest assets because I just didn't before. Yeah. I didn't before. First and seek to understand, then seek to, seek understand. to be understood another one of those seven habits of highly effective people i try not to get ahead of myself you know like i said I, I just focus on basics fundamentals do do the right thing yeah we're back and the first question i have for you is what is your it factor a habit a trait a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success enthusiasm what is your biggest weakness arrogance what is 
one thing you look for, a question you ask or thing you look for when you're trying to grow your team? Enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is your biggest challenge today? Uh, probably staffing. How are you overcoming that challenge? We are providing an amazing place to work, and we're using Culture Index, mm -hmm. and we're being selective. Yep. It's hard. Yep. Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. So this is a way to be, a way to act. A way core to value. be, a way to act. Uh, we have a, a core value here of do the right thing. And the do the right thing isn't a like left or right, right or wrong. It is a we empower you to make the decision. We empower you to make the right decision. And even if it's the wrong decision, if you feel like you're making the right decision, we'll go back and we'll talk about it later, but you're not going to be in trouble. We won't just do the right thing. What are your four additional core values? We have cheers, which is have fun all the time. Do the right thing. Um... We love our community, Turbo Boost, and remember me. I love it. <laughs> I was I was sitting on that. You said you'd be able to do it, so I was like, "Let's see." Okay, all right, you did good. Good yeah. job. <laughs> what is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So something that's common within the four walls of your business, but not common throughout the industry. I don't know if I have one. I'm sure you do. We're pretty basic. I'll I'll take one for you, man. It's about the relationships. You focus on relationships. I think people make it transactional, not transformative. Okay, yeah, you nailed, you nailed it. Yeah, what we do, you know, in this house we're in right now, we have nine private dining rooms, and we host a ton of weddings and rehearsal dinners. So really, people entrusting us with those memories, mm -hmm. we realize people are doing their rehearsal dinner here, and they're going to remember this night for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So being memorable, it's one of our core values of remember me, is we want, we encourage every single person to be as memorable as possible because... We want people to, to cherish these memories they have in this home. I love it. What is one book to make us a better person or a restaurant operator? Well, I would say QBQ is, yeah. uh, is my, was my go-to all the time. And you mentioned traction, which I need to read. That's so another. I'm, I'm going to bring process. that to the surface. Yeah. Uh, what is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough? Hmm. Checking in with their staff. Having one-on-one -on -one conversations to find out how people are mentally, physically, and if they can help. Name one service you've hired or outsourced. Not necessarily a technology, but a group of people who do something better than you could ever do in a house, so you outsource. I work with a company um, called Neat Mixology, and they create some of my cocktail menu, and they do my inventory every single week, and they help me, they consult on my P&L, and they give me recommendations. That was Neat. Neat Mixology. Mixology. What is one piece of technology you've adopted within your restaurant that's had a huge impact on communication, efficiency, profitability, anything along those lines? Zenput. What is Zenput? Zenput is a digital checklist. So every single thing that we do in the building is on an app called Zenput. And the manager walking in the back door, he pulls it up, it geotags them when they start it, and it tells me how long it takes and where they are while they do it. So it open the back door, you push the button, go, and it says, say hello to the kitchen staff. And then it walks you through every single aspect of opening the restaurant. All of my servers, closing duties, opening duties, manager mid duties, manager closing duties, chef's closing duties. <laughs> Everything is on a neat thing that sends me a dashboard that ensures that every single detail gets completed every single is day. Is there pushback on implementing things like this? Hell yeah. How do you overcome the pushback? Because from my Consistency. experience, it's, it's, it's the technology is great. It's getting people to adopt it and staying consistent with the pressure to adopt it, that's the challenge. You have to get your leadership team on board, and everybody consistently every single day has to do it. Why? How do you get them on board? You explain to them the features and benefits. Things, understand me, I can let them make the decision. You can write it down every single day on this clipboard and this piece of paper and you can keep track of it yeah or you can walk around with a phone and click yes i've done it take a picture when it's done yeah and they see they see the benefit at to first it. i think it's a lot more resistance because you haven't developed habits around the checklist but all the checklist is doing is helping you develop habits oh yeah and then the checklist just acts like something that you kind of go through to, to verify that you've done it like you don't have to be like T -t 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 -t. i mean maybe this tool wants you to do it that way but you get a lot of most most managers do it in 19 seconds yeah exactly it's but a, it's an accountability piece. You know, so I have a bartender who does their bar closing at night, and they click that they stocked white wine, and they click that they did this. Then the AM bartender walks in and goes, who fucking closed last night? And they go <laughs> through their laundry list of shit that wasn't done. I can pull yeah. this input, and I go, 
Janie closed last night and she clicked that she did that. And that's a great one-on-one opportunity to sit down and say, you clicked that you did these five things yet you did not do them. Yeah. And it's an account of this versus, oh, look up is it? Well, no, you clicked and you signed your name. Yeah. Like at the end of it, you have to sign your name that I finished this list. It's great. So for accountability piece, yeah. it's really nice. I, I would not disagree. This is the last question. It's a doozy. Okay. Get ready for it. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? Oh, my God. <laughs> that is heavy. That, yeah, that's a man. big question. Three pieces of wisdom? I... I God, I don't know. I'd what was that like, one quote that you gave me? Um, the, by the grace of God, to know what's right, and then to know, like, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was like, the, what you, what helped you kind of get right w- with dealing with your. Oh, the serenity prayer. Yeah, the serenity prayer. Yeah, I would. I, so that there's a great thing I would tell people. Yeah, I would say don't, don't sweat the small stuff, is a big one. Yeah, that's one. Don't sweat the small stuff. Um, Affect things that that you can change. If we go back to the the serenity prayer, yeah. you know, which would be um, focus on what you have control over. Focus on what you have control over. Give us one more. And love hard. Yes, I've loved this conversation, Brandon. Thank you so much for, you know, n- not just today, but for being supportive of me and the podcast. Uh, for letting me be a guest on your show for opening your network up to me. You introduced me to Ben um, Goldberg. Goldberg. Thank you from strategic hospitality. I'll be talking to him on Friday. I'm really excited for that conversation. Uh, and just thank you for everything, man. There, and we wrap. I mean, I, I kind of feel guilty asking you to call somebody out because you've already been so generous with your network, but who's somebody who we haven't gotten on the show yet? Um, who do you respect and admire and believe would make a great guest mentor like you made for us today? <sighs> you know, I'm going to say uh, Stephen Smithing, the man who owns these restaurants, who's my best friend and a guy who um, who runs restaurants. He's a fantastic operator. He's been doing it for a really long time. and has a really great story. Uh, he's a leader. He's a mentor. He cares for people. More, he's taught me so much about how to how to care for people and empathy. Uh, he's one of those people that I look up to, and I think uh, his story would be great to hear. Steven, look out. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you on the show. and Hopefully we can get it to happen while I'm out here on this trip, but I know I'm coming back. If it doesn't happen this time, it'll, 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 it'll happen again in the future for sure. Uh, how can we connect with you? If we've really enjoyed today's conversation, maybe you want to listen to your podcast, maybe we want to hire you for your, your services, what's the best way to connect? Uh, I am on Instagram at Brandon underscore NRR. That is like my public, uh, Brandon underscore NRR. Um, I am www.nashvillerestaurantradio.com. And uh, Facebook, same thing, Nashville Restaurant Radio. I really reply to all of those things. I have a New Light Hospitality. My company is called New Light Hospitality um, Solutions. But I don't really promote it. I don't go out and do a lot of stuff. Obviously, having this full-time job, I have two kids that are six and eight. A wife... I stay pretty damn busy. But I'm sure, man. I don't know how you do it. I'm doing a couple vendor negotiations right now, helping out some people and um, just having fun. I'm having a great time. Brandon Still, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story, your knowledge, your mentorship. There is no question, my man, you are unstoppable. We'll cut it there. It's been an honor to be here. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.